I'm Ruka Zaziano as FNC just said and the DGS, which if you join Cornell and we'll be very happy if you do, um, you'll get, need to get used to the, all the acronyms that we use. So DGS is Director of Graduate Studies. So that's what I am for Systems Engineering. And so just a, to give you a very clear example of the breadth of our program, I'm not even an engineer, I'm an economist. I do research that uses economics um, and economic principles for engineering problems. And that's basically a very clear example of what systems engineering is about, because you need to take into consideration everything that goes with the system. And usually we focus as engineers, you probably are engineers, um, on technology, but then techno technology is being used by people. So we need to also understand how people interact with the technology we are designing and to make um, changes that are techno technologically good, but also are successful in, in, the, in society, we need to think about how people will interact with that technology. And that's the thing I do for my own research. So I do basically economic models of how make people make choices <laughs> regarding mostly energy efficiency and other applications, as you can see in my slide here. So yeah, so Feng Chi also was mentioning a little bit about our history of, of the program. So back in 1999, it was the first ever course in systems engineering here at Cornell. And then another thing that you'll start hearing a lot is fields. So in addition to programs and departments. So systems engineering, for example, is not an actual department at Cornell. We also have fields. So once you join us, um, you'll notice that you will be, as a graduate student, you'll be belonging in some way to a specific field. There are many fields and systems engineering is one of these fields. And then basically that will be kind of your major of your program. And then We'll be talking in a second about minors. So you'll be choosing minors that belong to a different field. And then in 2009, we launched the distance learning program, which is very successful for the master's of engineering um, degree. Then 2011, and this will come back in a second to the ESRO Roundtable Systems Engineering Seminar, which is a core of our program. We invite people that do um, Set of the art research in systems engineering to come to Cornell and give very, very interesting talks that Fen is the organizer of this seminar. He can take talk about more about that in a second because it's one of our um, course um, that are required for both the MS and the PhD. And then the actual PhD was launched in 2016. So it's not completely new, but relatively a young pro program. We can move ahead to the next slide. So system research, um, there are many, many applications, many concepts that we use and you learn in your required courses. So system science, systems engineering concepts, um, systems architecture, um, modern and simulation, all those that I just mentioned, they can be mapped into your required courses. But then there are also courses that are not part of the required courses, we'll be seeing that again in a second, which is the, the elective courses. So decision support, for example, th there are courses you can take about how we model decisions and that you need to make as engineers, as designers, as policy makers, um, and also applications. You can see there health, food, water, energy, climate, transportation. I work mostly in the case of transportation and energy mostly. Um, some a little bit on health to um, military. Traditionally, systems engineering has a very long tradition on military applications, but here at Cornell, we focus not on, only on aerospace and military applications, we focus basically in the whole range of uh, applications that need um, systems engineering concepts. So careers, um, so it depends on what you want to do. Um, I would say that most of our graduates that now um, looking into positions in industry. And there you see some examples of where you could aspire to reach as 
one of our graduates. And so one of the national laboratories, that's a very uh, clear example. Also, any work that needs a high level project leadership with a core knowledge for, from your specific field, um, but also um, bringing the, the system science aspect and dimension to your knowledge. Um, engineering firms in general, uh, systems of systems engineers, and then you got a, an academia, basically anywhere that they would need someone who understands not just a very specific and narrow uh, application area, but has this breadth that we expect that it will bring to you with our courses. And of course, also government, that's another area that you could follow a career in your future. So requirements. So for the PhD MS courses, they're very similar. Basically, the requirements are the same. So you would you would be taking on your first semester, you'll be taking Sizing 6000, which is Foundation Complex Systems, which is a modular course, um, which is um also um organized by Fenchi. And so different professors from Cornell, sometimes we also invite professors from, from our universities. They give one or two lectures and very diverse topics, but very important topics that give you an idea of the basics and the fundamentals of all the domain knowledge and application that we can use for approaching any problem, but from a systems point of view. Sizen 6150, System Processing Systems Research. Um, Sizen 8000, which is the doctoral colloquium, which is kind of um, first semester you're here, you, you are kind of lost. You don't know how to focus on your thesis in the case of your MS or your dissertation in the case of your PhD. You need to be kind of given tools and skills to follow your research and start your research. And that are things that you'll be discussing. It's not an actual course in some way, it's just one credit, this size in 8,000. And then size in 8,100, is that the Ezra seminar that I was mentioning. Um, so maybe Fenchi, maybe you could say a couple more things about 6,000 and about also 8,100. Yeah, sure. Um, so 6,000 was really the course we created for the PhD program six years ago. As we try to understand what exactly are the core skills and techniques that our students would equipment would learn throughout this PhD process and how this course could be helpful to them to support their career development and professional development in addition to thesis research. So you will see, I think there is a later slide, we talk about 6,000, which is more like a combo, you know, the same way as you go to see a buffet, you get seafood, you get meat, you get vegetable, you get fruits, you get many other topics. So 6,000 is such a nice combination that covers a variety of topics relevant to citizen science and citizen engineering. Uh, for instance, Professor Ricardo, uh, you know, does anyone is teaching a section on this microeconomics, you know, uh, rational behavior and decision-making and teaching modules on optimization, machine learning, and, and so on. And there are topics also relevant to learning their dynamics, networks, theory, uh, system thinking, in addition to many other topics like tuning, when the discriminatory design, et cetera, et cetera. So we don't expect students to become an expert in these topics through these, you know, one lecture or two lecture sections per week. But the key idea is to expose students to a variety of research tools and methods and theories relevant to system science engineering so that the students will be able to explore them later on in their thesis research by taking further courses or by taking the research literature to learn more and train them to be the experts in the area that they are familiar with and they're interested in. And that's basically 6,000, and I'd be happy to share a copy of syllabus and process to you. So one very important feature for 6,000 is that it's highly research oriented because this is a PhD level course, right? It's different from like undergraduate course or master and engineering course, which is more coursework basis with tons of homework assignments and exams. So there's no exam in 6,000. So you are, the students would need to work on a homework assignment every week for one single module, right? And at the end of the semester, they are expected to complete a paper, a project paper, and also present to the faculty and students. And that project should be relevant to their thesis research. So we designed 6,000 to be fully integrated with the PhD and MS program. And this is a course required for all students in the PhD MS program. 
So for either assessment seminar, uh, this, is, this is a generic course that's open for all students involved in assistance program, PhD, MS, in addition to MH. And we sometimes have undergraduate sign up for this seminar program as well. So it's pretty much the same as all the seminar programs you see in other places, you know, we invite speakers, uh, usually from outside Cornell, but sometimes we see in Cornell to talk about topics related to systems engineering. And in particular, we focus on the grand challenges that society are facing, like, you know, sustainability, environment, transportation, energy, healthcare, pandemic, food supply, et cetera, et cetera. So students would have a chance to expose to these world-class leaders in citizen research. They come from academic, they come from industry, and some come from non-government organizations, NGOs. And they're talking about a variety of topics. Some are more theoretical focused, some are more conceptual, some are more computational focused, some are more even hands-on. So it's a very nice brand to expose students to a variety of research areas, topics, and the state of the art knowledge in the field. Usually the seminar speakers are nominated by the faculty, but we also open up opportunities for students to nominate speakers. And you know, for existing PhD MS students, you probably already received emails uh, over the past few days asking for speakers for next semester. So that's also an opportunity. And we are also exper you know, experimenting or trying some possible ideas to having our students to present a seminar program, but that has not yet been formalized yet. So as you will see in the process, we are continuing developing this program and we definitely look forward to the best quality of speakers from all over the world to come to interact with our students uh, to help us and to help them as well. Wonderful, thank you. So in addition to these four courses, um, in discussion with your main advisor, basically you'll be looking into which other courses you'll be taking. Usually those other courses are electives in different areas, such as the ones that you see in the slides. So risk modeling, human centered modeling, system design, or system science. So those are just examples. It will depend on the actual research you will be doing. So that's why basically you discuss with your main advisor what your electives should be. Um, also, um, in terms of the committee that you'll be having, um, in addition to your main advisor, in the case of PhD students, you basically need to choose two additional minors, which is basically from the fields I was mentioning before. Um, and then for MS students, it will be one minor. And again, this doesn't happen instantly when you just join. So you have some time to decide which your minors will be. And of course, will be in discussion with your main advisor. In the case of PhD students, uh, you'll have a key exam, a qualifying exam. So it's taken between um, around the end of the first year or a year and a half of the maximum since you joined the program. There are some requirements, basically in two of the required courses, 6,000 and 6150, you need to have at least a B as a grade. Um, and then it, the exam is based on an oral presentation about a research project. So you need to start doing research as soon as you join Cornell, so that when you have the Q exam at the end of the first year, you have something to share with your with the PhD committee that will be evaluating your qualifying exam. And then there are questions and answers about your research project. And some of the questions will be about basically how those two uh, core courses, 6,000 and 6150, basically they align with the research problem that you are looking into your dissertation. And then later you'll have an A exam, that's basically the thesis proposal exam. And then what we call at Cornell the B exam, and that's basically the final defense of your dissertation that's at the end of your studies. Here we have some example of typical progress in the program. So year one, fall semester, your first semester, you take basically the four courses that I was talking about. Then in the spring, you take some electives. So for example, you could take system behavior optimization, that's a system course that you could take, and then some electives based on what you discuss with your advisor. 
Then year two, maybe another systems course. There we have an example of systems architecture in the fall. And then I don't know, elective in a narrow area, for example. So that example is giving, giving an elective on human center modeling. And then in discussion with your main advisor and also by then end of the second year, you should have then your full committee. You'll be discussing with your committee which courses should I take so that they feel confident that you'll be granted that minor that you're choosing for your own um, case. So this is again about 6,000. So maybe even again, Sanchi, maybe you can talk a little bit. You mentioned a little bit about this already, but maybe you can give another round. Yeah, sure. Yes. Yeah, sure. Well, this is kind of like a low map we put together, you know, six years ago, about 6,000 on the left hand side. Uh, you can see there are a variety of topics, system theory, game theory, collective behavior, networks, evolution, adaption, pattern, formation, learning and dynamics. And these are basically topics we cover in the course, you know, emergence over scale, say organization over scale, that's how we define a complex system. Uh, and over the years, we, you know, we try to get feedback from students and from faculty, and there's a strong voice from students learning more about AI, especially topics related to optimization, machine learning, and deep learning. So we also have these topics included right now. So basically there is one topic covered per week, um, you know, over the throughout the semester. So there are dozens of topics, over a dozen of topics covered uh, throughout this semester. And again, each lecture is gonna be like three, two or three hours, you know, getting to more like a high level overview, but with sufficient depth for you to be understandable in terms of all the complexities and the technical advances as well as the state of the art of the knowledge. But by all means, you're not gonna become an expert, let's say in game theory or an expert in AI or machine learning by just taking a two hour lecture, right? This is more like an introductory section for you to skin the surface, understand the details. And there are also further readings, assignments, and also homework assignments that you'll be working on uh, in the course. So. Great, thank you. So some deadlines and dates and things about application, actual application. So basically, um, bachelor degree in engineering, mathematics, or science in general. So economics, as I said before, I'm an economist, so you're coming from social science, but you have um, some interest in basically connecting that social science knowledge to a bigger picture and incorporate engineering into it. Um, then our program would be a perfect fit for you. You will need three letters of recommendation, a statement of purpose. Try to add in your statement of purpose why you are choosing um, a program that is focused on systems as opposed to a program that is in, in specific fields. So for example, why is it, just to give you an example, and it would be good that you add to the statement of purpose Okay, I could have applied to a transportation engineering um, program, but I'm really interested into the bigger picture of transportation. I'm really interested in policy and environment, not just the transportation system itself. So I think that the systems engineering PhD is a better fit for me. And then you can elaborate more on that, just to give you an example. Um, then the deadline, right? PhD application deadline is January 15. Um, for MS, um, it's actually June um, 1st. And Jessica, who is here, um, um, you can contact her to give a um, fee waiver code. And there is also the link there to where you can go to apply. And also you can search Google our website, Systems Engineering Cornell, and then you'll find all the information there as well. And there you have our contact information. If you have any question, just shoot us an email. We'll be very glad, happy to answer any question you may have. And also now, um, if you have questions, uh, just let us know. Um, and there are some students that are current students from our program. So maybe we can go around and you can introduce yourselves and talk a little bit about um, your experience in the program and then feel free to you know, raise your hand or put a question on the chat if you have questions for us um, right now.
So um, maybe Han, could you maybe start? Um, hi everyone. Um, this is Han Shu. I'm currently a third year PhD at System Program, and I work with Dr. Jacob Mace. My research is about applying optimization method to electricity market. Specifically, we focus on the electricity market mechanism design. Um, and a project I recently finished is we look at the resource adequacy. We build a massive mathematical model to analyze of why some failures happened in Texas, in Australia, and Europe. And we propose some recommendation, policy recommendations to how to resolve the problem. And now I'm working on a a different project on transmission cost uh, allocation and to reallocate how the how the cost be. So um, my experience so far with the project is pretty good. I um I'm so my research is mainly about the inter interdisciplinary study of um, mathematics, economics, and engineering. I find the uh. I find the topics really fascinating and the system program uh, really gave me the chance of explore the uh um the um the interesting topic and I saw some questions in the chat yeah there's a specific question that applies to all of you the the students will be speaking where what are your favorite and least favorite parts of your graduate studies and so my favorite part is i think the people here um i met a lot of fellow students friends and professors and they are really helpful as friends as tutor as the role models um and they um gave me uh some uh, uh they give me the picture that um, what should I develop for my skill set and how to prepare my career? And uh, maybe the, something I don't like maybe might be the weather. It's pretty cold during the winter, and I come from a place where it's pretty warm, and I need the time to adapt to the half year winter period. Thank you. So maybe Xiang, maybe you could go next. Um, hi everyone, my name is Shang, uh, Shang Chen. I am now in my fourth year of my PhD. I also did IMNG uh, here in systems. So I have experienced both the IMNG and then transitioning towards the PhD. Um, I focus most of my research on building digital agriculture systems. Uh, so focusing on the intersection of technology and agriculture. Um, my professor is Hakeem Wadderspoon in computer science. Um, I would say my favorite and least favorite parts of the program. Um, yeah, I think my favorite part of this program is really kind of the, the breadth of research and uh, the different expertise that we have in the program. You can really tap on a lot of different professors, advisors that really come from very different fields and then try to uh, really come together with a very interesting problem and solve that during your research. Um, yeah, I'd say I, I'd echo that my least favorite part is probably the the really cold winters in Ithaca. Um, that's uh, definitely a challenge, especially when you're there for a long time. Um, so yeah. Thank you. So Veronica. Hi everyone, my name is Veronica. My advisor is Ricardo, so you've seen him talk here a bit about his research. Um, and my research project as an MS student is actually expanding an R econometric library. It's open source, so maybe if some of you do research in this area, you might happen to use my code, so thank you in advance. Um, and I've loved Cornell. Um, I actually changed my admission decision from NYU to come to Cornell just because of how much I loved it, and I had really good experiences when I did research as an undergrad student here. Um, I didn't do my undergrad at Cornell for reference. Um, I, I did it somewhere else. And I just found that the faculty was so wonderful and everyone is really great about wanting to speak to you about the research. So it's a really great place to come if you want to, you know, I guess, figure out what are you interested in. And I think there's a lot of great opportunities to talk to other graduate students, as well as a lot of different faculty in a very diverse set of areas and really be able to explore those interests that you have. So 
I had a lot of interest in ECE. I was able to take a lot of courses in ECE, which is something that other programs wouldn't have allowed me to do, as well as take ones that are actually relevant more towards my research. So I really appreciated being able to get a breadth of knowledge over my time here, which is something that I had a really hard time finding for other programs to really let me address. Um, and in terms of least favorite, um, I mean, graduate school is hard. You know this. This isn't news for anyone. Um, it can be really challenging, and the weather obviously does not help because Ithaca is a little bit dreary. But I think that if you do winter sports, it helps at least make the weather not that bad because then there's something enjoyable happening. So <laughs> if you can find a better side of the winter, then I think that makes it a little bit easier to get through. And Akash, thank you, Veronica. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Akash Azgekar, uh, second year master student in the system engineering department at Cornell University. Uh, my research interest is uh, federated learning for energy systems, and I'm work work currently working under Professor Yu's supervision in the PAC lab. Uh, my responsibility is to determine how federated learning could be applied in smart buildings that are concerned with uh, heterogeneity and data consistency issues. Um, uh, my time here at Cornell University has uh, equipped me with the knowledge and abilities necessary to achieve my goal. And uh, the systems and the computational optimization courses uh, here are invaluable resources that I utilize frequently uh, in my research. And uh, with that, each course uh, instructors are understanding, uh, patient and highly qualified. Uh, finally, uh, I have a fantastic learning community at Cornell here and uh, my classmates and co-workers taught me a lot. And uh, here I found peer learning and mentoring to be extremely beneficial. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, talking about the question, uh, my favorite part here at Cornell in systems engineering is the people uh, in this department. So uh, everyone is highly qualified and uh, has the ability to collaborate with each other. So we get to learn a lot from each other when we collaborate with them as everyone is working in different areas in systems engineering. Uh, so um, by collaborating with them, uh, they are very helpful here. And with that, we can yeah, use their knowledge and share our knowledge so that um, it will be helpful to gain some valuable research out of that. And um, my least favorite part here is, uh, as Veronica told, that the weather. So no, nothing in the department, but the weather is pretty bad as I come from India and I don't have a very good ex like experience with uh, a heavy snow and all. So it's something new for me and I'm getting used to it. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you. So we have a couple of questions about um, advice or funding, and so I'll answer both because the, the answer is related. So the way that our program um, admissions work, basically from the beginning, based on your um, interest, um, you are actually asked to identify Cornell faculty that you would be inter interested to work with during your application. And then basically you'll be um, matched with an advisor from the very beginning. Unlike our programs where you are joined and then later you choose an advisor. Basically here from admission, you are matched with an advisor already. And that advisor needs to commit funding for you uh, in the case of the PhD students. So that's how it works. So basically, um, you're matched to an advisor, that advisor commits funding, and you, in your admission letter, will come with the details about that funding coming from that specific advisor. I don't know if you want to add something about that, Sanchi? Yeah, sure. Um, I think, you know, uh, Ricardo has covered all the details. Uh, fundamental issue is, you can see, we have a relatively new program, right? We grow very, very fast, by the way. If you look at a trajectory and, 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 and a trend, we, we are really growing exponentially, which is really good news, but still we are young and small uh, in general. And in particular, system is also so diverse and highly interdisciplinary, as you can heard you know, from the students. We have you know, faculty working on transportation, on energy, on cloud computing, you know, Shang's advisors in computer science, I think Han's advisors in civil environmental engineering, among many others. So the coordination is really an issue, and that's why we are not operating like a 
traditional department in a way that we meet students first and then we have students look around shopping around to find out advisors and so on. That's not a typical approach in system engineering, although it's indeed approaching many other programs at Cornell and also uh, other universities. So when we made an admission decision, uh, you know, the committee will definitely meet and review every case carefully. But one major criteria is that we want to make sure there's a perfect match between the student and the advisor. All right, so that's really the number one criteria that we look for. If a student is excellent, wonderful, but then there's no really a good fit of faculty that's able to work with her or him or was able to fund this particular applicant, we may not be able to proceed. So that's the key issue. And what that means is basically every student when you come in or even before you come in, you know who your advisor will be. And in this case, it, it may be one single faculty members or could be multiple of them. So there are co advising cases out there as well. So when we say advisor, it doesn't mean a single person, but by all means, there's no advisor selection process after you come in. So the process should take, it, should take place before a student is admitted. And that's not even also the funding size Ricardo mentioned, because basically uh, Cornell is expensive, <laughs> as many of you know. Um, so we don't want to create a case that a student is admitted, but then there is no advisor that's going to be what with her or him. That's going to be a problem for the student and also for the program. So we want to make sure that the advisor would commit funding throughout the PhD duration for the particular admitted student. And this is, of course, is for the PhD program. If you're applying for MS program, then this is going to be a self-funded program, right? So you'll be required to bring your own funding source for yourself. And you know that covers tuition and a living expense. For PhD, there's a you know a P, you know, tuition covered by the advisor in addition to the university level uh, stipend, usually in the form of a research assistantship or teaching assistantship, among others, and health insurance. So for PhD, the major issue is the funding, as I think some of you are asking, and we want a perfect match between a student and advisor's research interest and also funding interest. Okay, we always have cases that, you know, a faculty want to work with a student, but there's no funding. And those cases, as far as I could tell over the past six years, never work out in the end, right? So um, that's an unfortunate situation, but it's the same as, you know, I think you can understand that, you know, how we run a proper program in a way that is high quality. We have excellent faculty, world-class faculty, and also excellent students, right? So if a student is excellent enough, I think the faculty will be able to uh, support him or her through some of our projects. And we will leave this maximum flexibility to student and faculty discuss and figure out among themselves. So one piece of suggestion, and I think it's required now in application form is that every application should clearly mention one or multiple faculty's names who you think should be your advisors. And basically your application will be forward to those faculty members. And the committee will definitely seek the advice and inputs from those faculty members in terms of whether they're interested in this particular applicant, how do they confirm the funding details and so on. So in terms of scientific interest, it's very hard for us to regulate saying that, you know, students will be working on more like social science oriented or more be natural science oriented, more engineering oriented project. We are so diverse and so interdisciplinary. So we leave it to faculty and students to decide. And arguably we have participating faculties and students in the program working on problems related to architecture, for instance, relevant to social science and library, as you mentioned, engineering, or even some sort of very much, you know, even hands-on experiments like, you know, soft robotic systems as well. It's highly interdisciplinary and diverse. And we do want to maintain this diversity, which is really a motivation and, uh, and a strength and a source of our innovations. I think there's another question quickly come out. Uh, uh, we learn if the advisor is planning potential before they are selecting the application. Well, I think you're asking whether the advisor has funding or available or not. Well, we encourage you to reach out to faculty uh, you, you are interested in to find out whether they are, in, they are willing to, you know, uh, they have available projects for you or not. And I think Jessica has been helping to run some kind of uh, poll or survey among faculty as well, which really the information is something you can reach out to Jessica if you are interested in that information. But, you know, with funding, it's very complicated, right? Right now, sometimes, for instance, um, a faculty may not have funding right now, but maybe next week, they would receive some big grants and they're certainly going to look for students. So that could, that could be possible. And the other cases would be like, okay, I'm still, I mean, many of our faculty have 
uh, are involved in multiple graduate fields, right? Say, you know, a faculty member would like to have a student working on electric power systems, then he or she could have a student from system engineering or maybe find a student from electric and computer engineering or civil environmental engineering, right? There's no particular bonds in that I have funding and I have to commit to this particular program. So this is really a two-way selection between the student and the faculty. And we really this for selection and matching between uh, the applicants and potential faculty members to um, decide. Yes, yeah, so just as Sanchez was saying, um, we really encourage you to to contact the, the, your potential advisor that you think is a good match for you. Check their website first to see if they have any opening before contacting them. That makes it things easier for you to know whether they have openings. Sometimes they don't uh, update their uh, website. So in that case, feel free to send them an email. Um, and tell them that you're considering applying to the systems um, uh, program and that you would like to know um, whether they have a current opening in their um, group. And then from there, you can follow up with a meeting with them, but feel free to reach out. That's the best way of basically knowing. Um, there is another question here about um, external industry funding. So, um, that's um, kind of complicated. Um, in principle, yes, but um, there are a couple of things that in in practice, they make it very difficult and then usually it doesn't happen. It's two things. First, um, we have a resi residency requirement of a whole year. You have to be in the second, your first whole year um, as a full-time student. Um, and also there is a limitation. Now, I don't remember the, the number of hours, maybe Jessica remembers, but there's a limitation on the number of hours you can work for your company. And it's very little, it may be around 10 per week or something like that. I, I don't remember the exact uh, number, but that um, makes things complicated for um, external industry funding. And I think, you know, if I could just add here for industry funding, there could be different forms, right? I'm not sure you're asking more like for your current employee or others. For instance, a professor may get a grant from a company and they could use the grants oh, yes. for a PhD student. And in that case, that's definitely allowed. Cornell has many cases like this. But if you're thinking about industrial funding from your current employer, then that's going to be a bit complicated. You need to really sort it out, uh, you know. And, I think the distance learning PhD program is really something that we have been discussing a lot. But I think we can't even give you more information, but it's highly complicated. So yeah, the, there is another question here. So yeah, so um, so basically, we need to be clear about we the university actually does not allow self funding. So it's not if you have money from your family and we would like to pursue a PhD at Cornell, that's not um, accepted. But for example, we have a couple of students that currently that have NSF uh, uh, fellowships. So they apply to NSF, the National Science Foundation, and they got a fellowship and then they have their own funding. So, but still they need to have a match with an advisor, even if you're coming with your funding. And we also have a couple of examples with people um, coming with fellowships from their own countries. It's important that those, those fellowships, they cover everything, that they cover tuition, your stipend, and insurance. Um, so for example, one of my students is from Chile, um, and he has a full fellowship from the government in Chile, and that's also accepted. And then it was a good match for me, and then I was his advisor from the beginning. So still what we were describing in terms of having a match with an advisor, it applies even if you have an external funding and uh, source that will be accepted. If you have any question about a specific um, funding source and you're not sure if it will be accepted or not, you can send us an email and we'll be answering that to you. And just to add, I think the governmental fundings are definitely quite, you know, um, I won't say popular, but we have quite a few cases that in our PhD students are funded by governmental funding. I think Ricardo is a student funded by a Chile governmental funding fellowship, and I have a student funded by Thai governmental funding. And also we have a few students funded by like NSF fellowship, DOE fellowships, and so on. So the key point is these fellowships will be big enough to cover <laughs> the expenses. 
you know, some of the fellowships only like one thousand or two thousand dollars, and that's definitely not going to be enough for the PhD stipend tuition, health insurance. But if they are like, and as a fellowship, all these kind of governmental, you know, full scale fellowship, then this usually work. Cornell has an office of fellowships, by the way, that you can really reach out and, and talk to them. And I think the other question that I just see there, which could be quickly answered uh, from my end, is there going to be interviews or is it only going to be application materials? Well, the answer is very simple. It depends, right? And it really depends on how the committee sees the case. Some cases are strong enough, then we may just move ahead based on materials. And in some cases, the faculty may choose to uh, conduct the applicants for interviews. So there's no really a golden rule. And maybe you could just prepare for both. <laughs> I don't want to say there's no interview at all, because in some cases, we do want to look into interviews, you know, just to get more information. In some cases, a clear yes and clear no. And that's pretty much the same as any kind of job, you know, uh, applications that you may encounter. So I see someone is raising their hand, so I'll just uh, let them go. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Sayed Hassan Khalji from Pakistan. Uh... Actually, I have a question. Uh, can a uh, like bachelor student directly apply for the PhD uh, application, like uh, PhD position, for uh, if he meets the criteria and all? Can bachelors directly apply for the PhD degree, PhD program? Yes, yes. Um, if you if you are graduating from a bachelor degree, that's what we require. You don't have to have an MS or a master before. And join us. Okay, so it must have a, a highly like uh, good research profile or like what is like really judged in the application. Well, it, it really depends, right? I mean, I think we have some uh, students here at Han, for instance, she did a master's before she came to PhD, if I can remember. But I think Shang, or Shang also did an MNG before starting the PhD. So having some research experience in MS and MNG would definitely help. But we do have quite a few admits that are coming out directly from bachelor's degrees. Um, so the key point is that you should get your bachelor's degree before you started at Cornell. That's the baseline. If you are not even going to finish your undergraduate, then that's not going to be meeting the criteria. But what are going to be expected? Well, it depends. Every case is different. We get hundreds of applications every year, and everyone is so different. And Every faculty is also different in terms of, you know, what they are looking for and what kind of skills are needed. So there's no clear golden rule saying that you have to meet these, these, these to be admitted. No, there's no such a thing. The application is a full scale evaluation, looking to many criteria, many dimensions and involves some sort of uncertainties. An application that may not be admitted on first year, may be admitted on second year, just because of some, you know, environmental variables that change. And this is very typical in many cases and, and pretty much in all the graduate programs that you may. Interviews. Okay, thank you so much. And there was another question before, um, and maybe you can help me, uh, Fanchi, to answer. Um, oh, the condition admission. Does the university evaluation team automatically reject the application if the candidate has an IAELTS score is slightly less than the minimum requirement? Oh, I don't. I think this is something Jessica could help, but I don't think we take I I E S T score. That's more for English, you know, uh, European countries as well. In, in the US, we talk about TOEFL and GIE. I think GIE is optional now, right, mm -hmm. Jessica? And, and right, TOEFL is still required. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the TOEFL. There's a lot of new rules about, um, around that. So if you do have questions, you can reach out to me. Um, and I can work with you because it's all about individual circumstances. Any other question? Anything else we could help you? Oh, currently we don't have a PhD in distance in a distance learning format. Um, there are plans <laughs> maybe in the future, but currently there's no um, distance learning. Yeah. Well, currently it's our alarm, by the way. Uh, Ricardo, you probably remember he he was our he graduate. He's from Boeing and graduated mm -hmm. from our dementia program. Mm -hmm. So, Kurt, I think there are a lot of discussions about this uh, PhD program running distance learning, especially corporate sponsor uh, th uh, this PhD program. We have a new hire, Cliff. Uh, I forgot to ask them. <laughs> uh, Professor Cliff is working on this, but I, we have no idea how soon this will be possible because grad school has some strict rules in terms of. 
This is called minimum residence time for every PhD student. And there's no such a distancing PhD program across the campus at all so far. But things may change. Uh, Cliff came from, I think it's what, Air Force or, or Navy? I forgot. Ricardo, do you remember? We Navy. Mm -hmm. Navy, yeah. One of these kind of system engineering in a grad school, and he had some leadership roles there. So he was able to bring some experience to help us. Uh, but, you know, this is really complicated, not because of our program, but really because of a grad school. Because in master of engineering program, as you may know, it's not operated by the grad school. A graduate school really interests PHMS programs. Master of engineering program, as you can tell from them, is a professional master program. So it's run under college engineering, of course, CIS as well, right? And that's how, you know, if you're in art and science or in agriculture, they don't have a master of engineering program. <laughs> they go master of professional studies. And that's why we have a lot of flexibility as long as we could coordinate with the college. But PhD and MS in Cornell are really much centralized, managed by the grad school. So we do have to follow their rules. And at least as of now, uh, grad school never had any decent PhD program. So, and we don't know how long this is going to take, but I know there are a lot of voice, a lot of requests in this regard, but just, you know, we are moving along this direction, but it's just hard to tell how soon it's going to happen. <laughs> Thank you for uh, thank you for expanding on that. I appreciate it. We have a hand raised, so if you want to go ahead, you can ask your question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, actually, I'm coming again with a question. Uh, I, I I want to ask regarding like, is it advisable to like reach out to the professor first to see if like uh, his research interest and your research interest like aligns together, or is it like advisable to like first submit the application and then like reach out to professor then, like what is a better thing to do i would suggest that you contact um your expected ad or prospective advisor um as soon as possible hopefully before the application because then in your statement of purpose you can actually mention that person you can mention that you had contact already with that professor cornell so in some ways it will make your case stronger so it's better um it's not necessary but i would say better before the application than after the application okay yeah, right also, uh, thank you i'm just if, like worried if the professor would reply or not like on the email and like this well that's the issue right if the professor doesn't even reply to you uh why do you think a professor will be interested in telling us that he or she wants to find you okay right <laughs> well, it doesn't mean that that's not possible. It's possible, but um, uh, as Ricardo suggests, you know, reaching out before the application help because you don't want to put in some random names in the application. You know, if you check out application form, every applicant is required to put in at least one faculty name as your potential advisor. And if you're putting these names randomly, it basically sacrifices your chance of success. So my advice, right. my personal advice is reach out to people that put in names that who could be interested in you at least through some private communication. Okay, last advice I need. Actually, uh, we should reach out to the professor on their emails or like LinkedIn. Like, what would be the better? Everyone is different. So yeah, everyone is different. Yeah. Hundreds of faculty across the campus. Yeah. Okay, so I mean, if some I people don't to... even have a LinkedIn profile, by the way. So okay. you can know that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. If you have any question, please contact us. Thank you for joining. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, thank you.